from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Rachel Hardigan Shea. I'm the editor of the Washington Post Book World. The Washington Post is proud to be a sponsor of the National Book Festival, and I am very pleased to be introducing the next author. Lois Lowry didn't publish her first novel until she was nearly 40. But in the many years since, she has more than mastered the art of children's literature. She's won two Newbery Medals in 1990 for Number, Number of the Stars, in 1994 for The Giver, and published more than 30 novels. And she hasn't been afraid to try new things, whether it's historical fiction, science fiction, or a series of books about a mischievous girl. But she's never written a picture book until now. Crow Call, illustrated by artist Bagram Ibatoyin, tells the story of a long ago day she spent with her dad. Ms. Lowry will be signing books at 3 o'clock. Please join me in welcoming Lois Lowry. Thank you. It's, it's kind of interesting to talk for the first time about a new book and to try to answer some of the questions that kids always have. I'm going to start by telling you about a day in my life when I was eight years old. This is an answer to the question of how I knew I wanted to be a writer and when. And it was certainly a very long time ago. So picture me, eight years old, and I had a little brother who was two. I also had a bedroom that had a desk in it, and desks have always been my favorite piece of furniture. This is still true today. The stuff I like best is the things that are in a desk drawer. I think of that as desk stuff. Uh, and when, in the days when I was eight, that would have consisted of pencils, paper, crayons, scissors, paste, paper clips, desk stuff. On a particular day when I was eight, I wandered into my bedroom and discovered that my little brother, age two, had gone into my room when nobody was looking and had opened the drawers of my desk and messed up my stuff. It was all over the floor of my bedroom, all of that stuff that was so dear to me, and I was furious. There was my little brother in his overalls playing with my desk stuff. And in my anger, I picked up a tube of glue, the kind of tube of glue, I don't know if this still exists, that has a metal screw on the end that you un undo, and the glue is, it's the kind of stuff we must never sniff, okay? And I grabbed that from my brother and opened it up and I smeared the back of my brother's hand with glue. <laughs> and it dried almost immediately into a shiny crust on the back of his hand. And I stopped being angry at him because it was so interesting to look at that. <laughs> he and I both looked at that little chubby hand with now all the shiny stuff on it. And then I tried to take it off and it wouldn't come off. There was my brother with his hand forever encased in shiny glue. Okay, now jump ahead a couple of hours, and my mother says to me, would you take Johnny for a walk in the stroller? Okay, that was something I did often. We lived in a small town in Pennsylvania. It was very safe in those days, probably still is. And so my mother buckled my brother into his stroller, and off we went. Johnny and I down the street. I was the kind of kid, and all writers are this kind of person, who as I was doing something would also be telling the story of it to myself. So that flying down here yesterday, I was probably in the Boston airport saying, the author was going to fly to Washington for the book festival. She was waiting at the gate for her plane. That's just the kind of thing I do. I narrate my life, and I have always done this. 
So when I was eight years old, pushing the stroller down Moreland Avenue in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I was saying to myself, the little girl was taking her baby brother for a walk. She was a good child, helpful to her mother. <laughs> I was usually the, the heroine in my own narrated stories. Sometimes my mother was in, a villain. Her, mother, her lazy mother made her take the baby for a walk, but not always. Sometimes she was helpful to her mother, who was tired that afternoon. At any rate, this story was going on in my mind as we walked down Moreland Avenue. Coming toward me, I saw two what I thought of as old ladies. They may have been 40, but I was only eight. Maybe they were 85, I don't know. They seemed like old ladies, and they were walking together toward me, and I'd never seen them before. I didn't know who they were. But I could see their faces light up as they saw me coming, because it is kind of cute to see a little girl taking her baby brother for a walk. And as they approached, they stopped, and I stopped, and they admired my little brother sitting there in his blue corduroy jacket. And then suddenly one of these ladies reached down and picked up my brother's little hand and looked at it and said to her friend, this child has been badly burned. <laughs> and I knew exactly what I should say. I should say, no, I put glue on his hand. But what happened was in telling the story to myself, the little girl was taking the baby for a walk I realized instantly that it was a better story. <laughs> if it was the little girl was taking the badly burned baby for a walk. And so I, I changed my, the smile that I had prepared into a sad look. And I nodded and agreed, yes, badly burned. Now, there's no ending to this story. If I were writing it, it would have to, that would be the middle part, and it would have to have some interesting twist at the ending. But it doesn't, because it's just a real life incident. It's an anecdote, and when I got home, the glue eventually wore off my brother's hand. The old ladies didn't call a child abuse hotline and report me. Uh, I, there was, there's no ending, except that it made me aware, as I've always been aware since, and maybe had been aware before then, how a story becomes interesting, how the little bits and pieces you add to it, the badly burned baby, becomes an interesting story, and how, how essential the words are that you put in to make it do that. Okay, now I'm gonna jump ahead many, many years. From the time I was eight, I wanted to be a writer, 10, 12, 14, 16, I went to college with a special scholarship to study writing because I had won some awards in high school. But I dropped out of college very young, 19, and got married. And my creative life took a different form. As I had a baby when I was 21, a baby when I was 22, a baby when I was 24, and a baby when I was 25. And so, my goal of being a writer was sort of put on hold for a number of years. But then I went back to college when my kids started school and I started writing again. I was writing, however, for adults. I saw myself as somebody who would write novels for grown-ups. I was a grown-up after all. But it wasn't happening. I was writing things and sending them off to publishers and I was getting rejection letters. And I was also at the same time raising my children. Okay, now it's 1975 and you have to do some math. I can't do it quickly. I was born in 1937, so it's now 1975. That makes me how old? Late 30s, say. And one morning, my husband had gone off to work, the kids had gone off to catch the school bus, and I was alone in the house, and the dog was out in the backyard. It was November, and I went outside to scrape some leftover scrambled eggs into the dog's dish. And I stopped when I got outside, because there was something about the smell of the air that triggered a memory. 
that's, that happens to us. A smell, a sound, it will sometimes bring back something that you had forgotten that had happened many years before. So there I stood on the back porch of a house in Maine in early November. What could I have been smelling? I was smelling the children's Halloween pumpkins rotting still on the porch. I was smelling dead leaves on the ground, wood smoke, I think, coming from neighbors' chimneys, apples still hanging in the apple trees, though now they were turning brown, that kind of sweet smell of, of rotting apples, all of it combined. And I remember today in 19, probably 46, maybe 45, I would have been eight or nine years old. And I went back into the house, and I went to my typewriter. This is long before computers, 1975. And I sat down, and I began to write about that day. And the sentence I wrote was, it was morning, early, barely light, cold for November. I was nine, and the war was over. In the car, I sat next to the stranger who was my father. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute there to describe something. In almost every book or story that I've ever written, I have begun by introducing a character who will be the main character, the one you want to, the reader to care about, a little about where that character is, the setting, and then there will be a, a sentence, a word, or a phrase that will let the reader know that something is not quite right, something is askew. And I'm just going to veer off to describe a couple of my own books that you may be familiar with. Number of the Stars is one. Begins, the main character is running down a street, blonde hair flying, and then a few paragraphs on, there is a soldier with a gun, and he says, halt. Of course you know, something's wrong, what's wrong? Okay, another book. The first sentence is, it was almost December, and Jonas was beginning to be frightened. Okay, you know this book is going to be about a boy. He has a boy's name. His name is Jonas. Very soon you'll know his age and where he is, but in the first sentence you know something's wrong. Uh, he was beginning to be frightened. In this story that I was then just typing out in my own typewriter, uh, the, the little thing that's askew is in that second sentence that I quoted. Uh, in the car, I sat next to the stranger who was my father. It's, it's something's wrong if the father is a stranger. Okay, this goes back to my childhood in, in the 1940s. My father, a career army officer, had spent the war in the Pacific, and now he had come home. As it turned out, he was home only briefly because he had to go back to Tokyo, and eventually we would join him there. But now he's home for the first time in a very long time. And I was a kid, and I had missed my father, and I loved my father, but when he came home, I didn't know my father. He was a stranger to me. And I was, frightened would be too strong a word, but I was, self-conscious and nervous around him. I, I do, he was a stranger to me. Looking back now, I can realize as a parent myself that he would have felt the same way. I was a stranger to him. And so we were, we were two people who were in the position of having to get to know one another again. So I wrote the story of that day. It's a story that takes place over the course of simply a few hours. And like all stories, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has people who go out on a journey. Not all journeys are geographic ones, but in this story, the child and her father start out in a car. They're going out, and they will return. I finished the writing of that, and I sent it off to a magazine, a, a grown-up magazine. I wasn't writing for kids then, I was writing for grown-ups. And the magazine bought it and published it in their December 1975 edition. When that was published, a children's book editor read this story, wrote to me and said, you sound like somebody who could be writing for kids, would you consider writing a novel for young people? And with that invitation, I did write my first book for kids. 
but that had never been what, what I had intended. It surprises me now. I had four kids. I read to my kids. We had kids' books in the house, but I'd never thought of myself as a children's book writer. But it was that adult story that propelled me into my first book, and from then to, uh, I think now, 35 books. Okay. A couple of years ago, or maybe a year ago, I've forgotten how long, a children's book editor heard me talk about that story and contacted me and said, could I read it? So I provided her with the entire story. Incidentally, when I went to get a copy of that story at the Boston Public Library, I mean, years had passed. I didn't have a copy of it anymore. <clears throat> I went to the Boston Library to find an old copy of that magazine, which they did have, and there was the story, and I went to Xerox it. They said, sorry, you can't do that. That's copyrighted. Uh, so, I said, but I wrote it. That's my name. Uh, and eventually they let me, but I think it was illegal. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so I gave uh, Andrea Pinckney the copy of the story, and she asked, permission to turn it into a picture book for kids, although it's not really a story just for kids. Uh, it's a story for all ages. Then her job uh, was to turn it into the picture book that is here today. And incidentally, it's not even officially published yet. I believe you can buy it at the bookseller's tent, but you'll be the first because it's not really out, as they say. One of the things she needed to do, after she and I talked about a, a few minor, very small changes, she wanted the child in the book to have a name. And uh, it's told in the first person. And so when I'd first written it, I didn't give that child a name. She was me, after all. Uh, but in, in the book, I've named myself Lizzie. Uh, and I think there were a few other very minor changes, but not very many. But then the really important thing, this being a picture book, is she had to find the right illustrator. And magically, she did that. Now, the author and the illustrator very rarely meet each other, and I have never met the man who illustrated this book. But he and I corresponded a little bit by email. And one of the things he wanted from me was a description of the shirt that I was wearing in the book. Uh, and I'll, I'll read you a passage which will, will tell you what he was looking for. He also had a photograph of me at that age. And so the child in the book, in the pictures, is me. She looks like me at that age. I wish I had thought to give him a photograph of my father, because the father in the book doesn't look like my dad, but that's OK. All right. Uh, it's morning, early, barely light, cold for November. That's the first sentence. The first sentence of the original story was, I just said it to you a minute ago, and now my mind has gone blank. It was morning, early, barely light, cold for November. I was nine, and the war was over. The sentence is shorter, and it doesn't say that I was nine. It never says in the book how old the child is, but you can tell from looking at her that she's about that, that age. At home in the bed next to mine, Jessica, my older sister, still sleeps, but my bed is empty. It's been changed to the present tense instead of the past tense. OK, getting to the shirt in a minute. I sit shyly in the front seat of the car next to the stranger who is my father. My legs pulled up under the too large wool shirt I am wearing. <clears throat> I practice his name to myself, whispering it under my breath. Daddy. Daddy. Saying it feels new. The war has lasted so long. He has been gone so long. I realized uh, in, in talking to people after this was going to be published that Although this was World War II, the war of my childhood, it could have been any war. It could have been the Korean War, the war of my adolescence, when my father again was gone. It could have been the Vietnam War, and it could have been today. Uh, today's children will have this, many of them have this same experience of having a parent, father or mother gone for so long. 
Daddy, I say. And now you can see close up the child wearing the shirt. He had written to me, the illustrator, to ask me about the colors in the shirt. It's very hard to describe a plaid. I told him there were red and blue, and when they crossed, that became a muted purple, and then there were black lines like window panes across that, and he's done it exactly. Bring, uh, seeing that, uh, the paintings uh, reminds me exactly. I don't know what became of the shirt. I wore it for years. It was so large. Daddy, I say, I never, I've never gone hunting before. What if I don't know what to do? My father had taken me out for a day, just an outing, but with the two of us, and perhaps he did the same thing with my sister. I don't know, and my sister died young, so I never have had a chance to ask her. He made probably a, a poor choice. My father was a hunter. This was Pennsylvania. It was fall, hunting season, and so he took me hunting. And that, in addition to my being scared of him, I was now scared of what we were about to do. Well, Liz, he says, I've been thinking about that, and I've decided to put you in charge of the crow call. Have you ever operated a crow call? I shake my head, no. It's an art, he says, no doubt about that, but I'm pretty sure you can handle it. Some people will blow and blow on a crow call, and not a single crow will even wake up or bother to listen, much less answer, but I'm, I really think you can do it. Of course, he said, chuckling. Having that shirt will help. And then there's a wonderful picture of my father and me at a men's clothing store. I think when my father came home that time to Pennsylvania, he was wearing civilian, a uh, uh, uniform, excuse me, and so he went in town and took me with him to a men's clothing store to buy himself some civilian clothes. In town, it says to buy groceries. I think we were really there to buy him some clothes. He had noticed my hesitating in front of Cronenberg's window. The plaid hunting shirts had been in the store window for a month. The popular red and black and green and black ones toward the front, clothing mannequins holding duck decoys. But my shirt, the rainbow plaid, hung separately on a wooden hanger toward the back of the display. I had lingered in front of the window every chance I had since the hunting shirts had appeared. My sister rolled her eyes in disdain. Daddy, she pointed out to him as we entered the store, that's a man's shirt. The salesman had smiled and said dubiously, I don't quite think, you know, Lizzie, my father had said to me as the salesman wrapped the shirt, buying this shirt is probably a very practical thing to do. You will never, ever outgrow this shirt. And indeed, you can see on the cover, the child is wearing this enormous shirt, as I did that day with my father. But then there we are, out in that countryside, early morning, by ourselves, in the fall, me wearing the big shirt, me holding the crow call, which he's taught me to blow into, to make the sound of a crow, to attract crows, and he carrying the gun with which he is going to shoot them. Uh, it's a terrifying period of time for me, though, as the story moves along, you'll see that it ends happily. And we're moving along in time here, too, and I promised I would leave time for you to ask questions. And so maybe now is the time that some of you could be making your way up toward these microphones on either side so that we can hear the questions. Anybody got one? Jonas is alive, by the way. You don't need to ask that question. <laughs> you have a question? Okay. Right, go ahead. Um, how many books have you, have you written? You know what? Even with your microphone, I couldn't hear it. Hold the microphone a little closer up. How many books have you written? How many books have I written? You know, if you go to my website, you'll find a list of them, and you can count. And I'll try to count two next time I look at it. I think that I've written 35. OK, because okay. my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Anton, we're reading Gossamer. Oh, his teacher says in his class they're reading Gossamer. I'm going to tell you a brief story about that quite, quite recently. I have a grandson who's in sixth grade this year. But he told me this summer 
that in fifth grade last year, his teacher read my book, Gossamer, to the classroom. When my grandson told me that, he was standing in my kitchen. And there is a section in that book where a little boy who has been abused and taken away from his parents is finally describing what has happened to him, and it has happened in a kitchen. My grandson said to me, you know when Mrs. whatever her name was was reading that? He said, this is the kitchen I saw in my mind. He said, I know nothing like that ever happened in this kitchen, but that's the kitchen I saw. And it made me aware that my grandson and every reader who is a passionate reader does this, I do it myself, as you read or as you are read to, you create the pictures in your mind. And that was the picture he created of his grandmother's kitchen. It made me no know that he's a very passionate reader. I was thrilled to hear him say that. Okay, who's next with a question? Yeah. What is your favorite book? Do you mean my favorite book of the ones that I've written? Or uh, your favorite book of other authors, too. Hold the microphone up. Your favorite book of all authors. Of every book in the whole world? Oh, I was afraid she was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, one of my favorite books is, is one that I remember my mother reading to me as a child. And although I loved it, and, and really I love it still, and I've gone back and reread it. It was a book written for adults, but my mother knew how much I would love it because she knew me. And that book was called The Yearling by Marjorie Kinden Rawlings. And I suppose there are some of you out here who know that book. At the end of that book, the very last paragraph, and it's a long book written and published for grown-ups. The very last paragraph, the boy in the book the one with whom I identified as my mother read it to me, is now older. Many things have happened to him, and he has changed, as characters in books do. And he's asleep in the end of the book, and he wakes in the night because he hears something, thinks he hears something, and it wakes him, and there's nothing there. And then it says that he realized it was his own childhood voice that he had heard. And I love that passage, which I've misquoted, I'm sure, because I think it's what I listen to when I'm writing books. My own childhood voice is speaking to me all the time. OK, we have someone else with a question. Um, where did you get the idea for The Giver? And do you ever wish you lived in The Giver instead of this world? Uh, tell me the second half of that question again. The do question, you, where did I get the idea for the giver? And do you ever wish you lived in the world of the giver instead of this Okay, world? and do I ever wish I lived in the world of the giver? Uh, you know, the, the idea for the giver is, is very, uh, the origin of the giver is very complicated, and I probably don't have time to describe the many places it came from. I'll just describe very briefly that before I wrote the giver, was a time when my father was very old and in a nursing home and losing his memory. And when I went to visit him, I became aware suddenly that he had forgotten my sister. He always recognized me until he died at 92, but he had forgotten my sister. My sister had died young, his first child. And when I showed him a picture of her, he said, what happened to her? And I said, she died, Dad. And he was so saddened because he had forgotten that, and it was as if it, it was new to him. And so I changed the subject, but within a few minutes he had said again, whatever happened to your sister? And again I had, had to say, she died, Dad. And so when I went home that day, I remember specifically, I began thinking, what if there were some kind of drug we could give people, and they would forget every bad thing that had ever happened? And then when a writer begins to think, what if? A story begins to take shape, and I began to think about writing about a group of people, it became a community of people, who had found a way to manipulate human memory. But my answer to, would that be a good thing, uh, was of course no, and that's my answer to the second part of his question. Would I like to live in a world that had become so comfortable that we had no, no memories of the past or of things that had happened to us? Um, and, and, of course, Jonas's world, which I tried very hard to make seem appealing at the, first, at the beginning of the book, uh, has, a, has a dark underbelly to it. And no, nobody would want to live in, in a world like that, and certainly I would not. Okay, somebody over here? Why did you end the giver like that? Why did I end the giver like that? 
uh, I always thought it was an optimistic ending, and it was after that I, I began to realize that some people thought the boy was dead that I later went on to write two more books, and the boy Jonas appears uh, seven years later as a, as a man in the book Messenger. So it is a happy ending, and you'll see him later on. And the baby Gabriel is also alive and well. Okay. Okay, sorry, but I have a I have a police woman down here is holding up the sign that says I've gone over my time and so I'm not going to be able to answer any more questions, but thank you all for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.